of CISL, the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And I'm really pleased to welcome you on behalf of the UK Business Group Alliance for Net Zero. So today we're going to be exploring the challenges and opportunities of shifting the whole of the economy to meet the UK's net zero target by 2050. And also, how are we going to achieve the 2030 NDC emissions reduction target? A big priority for us in this discussion is to look beyond carbon in the narrow sense and to think about the connected lens on people, nature and climate. We have to acknowledge incredible progress already made by the UK. Over 50% of the FTSE 100 are now in the race to zero, and the majority via the Science-Based Targets Initiative, Business Ambition for the 1.5 degree campaign. So today is going to be a great debate. We're joined by the five leaders of the UK's top business networks. This event is going to be live streamed and we really encourage you to participate. Feel free to wave your hands because I'm dazzled by these bright lights. Um, but before we get cracking on our debate, I am really pleased to welcome our first speaker, Andrew Griffith, who's been leading the way this year in engaging UK businesses, personally meeting with many of the largest UK businesses to engage them in, them in the actions they can take. So I'm going to step down and give Andrew the floor to give you some highlights of UK action. Andrew, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Claire, and um, thank you for the work of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership. It's a brilliant combination of the science, technology, the application, um, and giving us all the data that we need in this emerging area. Um, the, one of the big ways that we're going to tackle this crisis is through new data, new techniques, new ways of measuring. If we can measure it, then we can take action to solve it. Um, and it's so good to be here with the five leading UK business organisations, um, all of whom have been incredibly generous with their time, their support, um, helping to motivate uh, and rally their members in this 12-month run-up to what has now arrived. It's still a, a little bit pinch myself that we're actually here. Um, the last 12 months have gone incredibly quickly. And despite the backdrop of a unprecedented global pandemic, you know, in many ways a headwind, but in some other ways an accelerant, uh, an accelerant of the change and the opportunity uh, that we all want to see to build back better. Someone was saying to me, I think Beverly, who's a veteran of these events, is that um, the business presence uh, at this climate summit uh, is greater than ever before. And that is not an accident from the uh, partner organizations to the agenda to the design layout of the venue. Um, the, one of the objectives of the UK presidency has been to harness what I call the ferocious problem-solving power of business. Because once these pavilions, recyclables, I hope they are, um, have all been struck uh, in 13 days' time, the hard work begins. Um, and that's the hard work of uh, bringing forward new techniques, cascading them at scale, um, and solving the planet's uh, crisis. In the UK, because this is a UK audience, we're talking about the UK business organizations, has an incredible responsibility, not just because the UK government has soft power, but also UK businesses exude soft power. It sits in their very supply chains. It sits in their boardrooms, which are the most diverse of any business community uh, on the planet. Uh, it's in our English uh, lingua franca uh, of England. It's in our um, mastery of many of the domains of measurement, whether it's the English legal system, uh, the work that's been done by accounting bodies in the past. Um, so we have a great responsibility, but much more so an opportunity now uh, to harness what we are doing. And I say not entirely in jest, but you know, almost, almost irrespective of what our leaders produce. And we do need them to produce um, some clear goals and ambitions now. Um, the quiet job of businesses with their tentacle supply chain spreading around the world, uh, helping to pioneer the decarbonisation revolution, is going to happen no matter what. And as Claire said, uh, we've already got half of the very biggest companies in the UK 
committed to rigorous science-based targets. That's more than any other global index, again, showing uh, the ability of the UK to really marshal these efforts. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to vacate your lovely, quite warm stage. Um, I feel globally warmed, uh, but um, I'm, I'm going to vacate the stage with a, a huge thank you and an acknowledgement. Um, it has been a joy. My role um, for these last 12 months would not have been possible without all of the business organizations, without, of course, uh, the businesses. And my plea, which I'm sure will fall on receptive ears, because it always has, is that those of us who are running the biggest organizations and the biggest uh, federations must make sure that it's a just and equal journey. And in the business context, that means bringing along our very smallest suppliers. It means being open to entrepreneurs and innovators, uh, as well as moving uh, with established suppliers. We've got to make it an opportunity for everybody and every part of the ledger. Uh, but thank you very much for having me. Um, please, any of you who haven't had the chance, come along and see the UK Pavilion alongside so many other brilliant organisations who've been working in this. You're there. I was counting them all out and counting them all in just to make sure I'd lost nobody in, the, in this dark room. So our panellists know each other well but you may not know them. You may not really know exactly what each of their networks do. So we're going to start by inviting them just to very briefly introduce themselves, what their network is for, and if they've got one provocation or takeaway from COP26 so far, they're welcome to share it. All that in about two minutes, three minutes each. I'm going to start with John Geldart, who is the Director General of the Institute of Directors. John. Oh, thanks very much, Claire, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. And uh, I think, as Andrew has said earlier, it's been a long journey, but it, uh, it doesn't seem to have, uh, it does seem to have passed very quickly this last 12 months. So the Institute of Directors um, represents essentially the middle market of the United Kingdom uh, business community. So uh, we have around about 60 or 1,000 followers on LinkedIn. We're about 20,000 members, and we represent the middle market. So those businesses really between two and 200 million pounds worth of turnover. And our raison d'etre is about the quality of directors. So for institute directors, read good governance. And to the point that has been made already by Claire and by Andrew, that knowledge of British institutionalized, if you like, good governance spreads around the world. And I'm delighted to see quite a number of colleagues here from China because we've recently just uh, started to open up in China to support some of the Chinese uh, leadership uh, around thinking about good governance. So just a couple of points to be provocative, if I may. Um, a survey just coming out this morning, um, which we've uh, placed in the media on our website, so iod.com. Um, we just did a survey of our membership about their preparedness for net zero. Interestingly, 28% are actually measuring their carbon outputs. Now, you might think that's quite small, and I think that's very good. 27% uh, have a plan to move to net zero, and 16% have a date, so a specific date by which they will achieve net zero. Now, just talking about this issue in terms of supply chain, I think that's a pretty good start, and yet a lot of a way to go. But imagine that's the supply chain that I know Karen and others will be talking about. So in that supply chain, a lot of people are already focused on net zero and that plan. Maybe not enough, because 51% say they'd like to see more government guidelines on what they can do. Many of them don't actually know what to do, although many are planning. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Now, I am going to bring you in, uh, Lord Karen Billamoria, who's the president of the Confederation of British Industry. Karen, over to you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, delighted that you're in the position that you are at Cambridge, and I chaired the business school for five years, and I'm disappointed that our tenures didn't overlap, but look forward to working <laughs> with you. Um, at the CBI, we've uh, really tried our best to get all our members, and again, to reinforce a point that Andrew made, that the impression is the CBI is the, the big business organization, speaks for the FTSE 100, FTSE 250. Well, we do, but we also speak for 190,000 businesses, and most of them are SMEs. So I think it's an important point that we have all business going. The challenge is there, and, and I think that we need to put it in context. So the Prime Minister said when he was mayor, he went to, to Beijing soon after he became mayor, and at that time, 40% of our energy was using coal, 
today in less than 15 years, it's 1%. So it's doable. We can make the change. And the point that you made is only a few months ago, I said one third of our largest companies had uh, uh, committed to net zero, market cap of about 650 billion by 2015. Now it's half. Mm. So the, the businesses are walking talk. I just want to quote from the Goal 13 platform where we surveyed businesses. And here's the reality. Six things. One, drivers of change. 79% of businesses now view climate as a mega trend. And this is the big change. Talking to people who've been at COPS, uh, Andrew spoke about this, um, who've been at COPS, they've said this year we've noticed businesses' presence more than ever, multifold. So here's one proof of that. Secondly, setting targets. And, you know, what gets measured gets done. And again, 89% uh, of companies in this survey have at least one climate-related target. The next is organizations. 64% it's the leaders, the company leaders. The next is climate initiatives. They've actually got specific initiatives, these companies. The next is barriers. They're aware of the barriers that are involved and what to do about them. And the next is lessons, building momentum, collaborating, communication. So it's there. It's now happening. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you. Fantastic. Now I want to bring in Siobhan Haviland, who is the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce. And I think we should clap her because she was on BBC Radio 4 at 6.15 this morning and clap me because I was awake to hear her. <laughs> <laughs> it's already been a long day. No, it's, deli yeah. it's delightful to be here, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, they, no small subject this morning at 6.15, uh, green finance and carbon taxes. Um, so... Uh, Thank you for having me. The British Chamber of Commerce represents the 53 accredited chambers of the UK, which spread from the tip of Scotland to the bottom of Cornwall, from Northern Ireland, across to Felixstowe. Um, but our best kept secret is that we also represent 76 and counting international chambers um, from all over the world as members. So truly unique global network. Most of, about 80% of our members are SMEs, um, but 20% are effectively the largest employers of the 53 chambers. So from EDF to Drax to Amazon to NatWest. So we really speak across, across the board. In terms of SMEs, I mean, it really is a challenge, um, Claire, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, they're coming out of a fragile recovery, Cash flow is tight, net zero is important, but they're not really quite sure what to do about it. So I'll talk a little bit more later about the two sides of that coin, net zero, which of course is very important, but actually more progressively, how do we drive green innovation? Thank you. Thanks, Siobhan. Uh, and last and certainly not least, uh, Stephen Phipson, who is the CEO of Make UK, which he will explain to you in its full glory. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for having me. It's really good to be here. Um, yeah, so Make UK. So we've been around 125 years. Engineering Employers Federation, as it was, for 120 years of that. Um, we represent about a million employees out of the 2.7 million employees in the manufacturing sector in the UK. So we go across all the different sectors, all the automotive companies, all the steel makers, all the foundation industries, all the energy intensive users, and thousands and thousands of smaller manufacturers across the whole of the country and I've got a small team of 400 people that look after them all basically in Make UK. And for us a really important event in COP26 and great to be here. There's a lot of excitement around. We can see a lot of excitement at the top end with the large manufacturers. A lot of commitments going on there and of course we do have some large challenges particularly around our foundation industries but I'm struck by the innovation I see there and really some of the plans for uh, achieving their objectives going forwards, which is really important. But the task is that supply chain. The task is those smaller companies. And I completely agree with what Andrew said about making this a just transition. We must do that. And we must bring thousands of those smaller companies with us. And one of those challenges, alongside financing and all the other things that have been spoken about so far, is around green skills. And perhaps this is an opportunity to unpack a little bit by what we mean by green skills, because certainly for the manufacturing sector, that's going to be one of the keys to achieving these objectives going forward. Thank you. 
Fantastic. So we're already hearing some very important uh, connecting themes here, but also some, in effect, some calls to action skills, the SME piece, and so on. So I'm going to chuck a few questions at our speakers, but please be thinking of your own questions. And um, I'd love to have some of you jump in, but as I say, you will have to wave your hands because you look like Harry Potter shadows to me, silhouetted <laughs> against, the, against the light. So first, as you can see in the title, we've talked about the whole economy. And we know that there'll be first movers, laggards, more prominent, less visible sectors. So John, why is it critical that all parts of the economy take action? and our help to take action? Well, I think it's, um, as Stephen has said, it's about the supply chain. So everything affects everything else. And without everybody taking uh, a view, everybody committing, all the way down the supply chain, when it falls apart at one part in a chain, and we know it falls apart at the weakest link, then the whole thing falls apart. So it's really incumbent on us as business organizations, but also in the, in the framework that government sets for us, to be able to encourage everybody in the supply chain to have a net zero target, to be on target for that target, and have a plan, and we love planning in business, uh, have a plan as to how they're going to achieve it. Because as Lord Billamore has said already, you know, without a plan, nothing happens. So it's super important, and it's the whole integrated approach as to why everybody needs to get involved. Can I, can I take you forward on that question? Because you, you talked about governance before and that importance you know, of really thinking about the quality of governance to be able to deliver against that. Do you want us to share a reflection on the governance aspects of that? No, no that's very helpful. And um, in the press release that's just come out, as I said today, um, one of the things we're asking for, not just from government but generally, is a commitment from business uh, to look at how they bring ESG into the boardroom. Uh, and that's not about having a separate committee on ESG. That's not mm -hmm. what it's about. It's about having a whole board approach to ESG. And what we're seeing increasingly is that is starting to take shape. Now, I, I would also say that it's about uh, at the supply chain in the, in the fullness of, of the whole thing, um, but also without good governance, without knowing what you're measuring, without framing it in an appropriate way, without challenging the boardroom, a lot of things won't happen. A lot of things won't get measured. And that's really super important. Now, we're introducing uh, that uh, uh, in terms of all our training that we're doing. We, we, about a third of our business is around uh, training directors. And we talk about better directors for a better world. And that is the core of what the IOD is about. Really, since we set up in 1903, we got our Royal Charter in 1906. And it is about improving the quality of directors through good governance. And government, yes, has a part to play. But we're calling for really is a code of conduct that includes ESG for all directors to sign up to, and we hope that will form a part of the debate going forward. And I want to say one final thing, which is to note, um, it is also about the capital markets. Mm -hmm. So thinking about the way the capital markets are going to look at this is also super important, and I would encourage people to go to a website which is called rewired.earth. Uh, I'll be speaking about that uh, next week at an event uh, we're holding here. Uh, and that really is about the whole economy of demand side, not just the uh, side in terms of business. So if we had the consumers being able to define mm. what they care about, that would make a big difference for pension funds and their investments into net zero. Well, that, re that resonates with CISL because we have two foundational pieces of research, rewiring the economy and rewiring leadership, again with this systems approach. So underpinning what you said, um, John, was purpose leadership and a transition journey. Karan, I'd like to bring you in at this point. I've heard you say that uh, the journey to net zero is not a zero-sum game. Can you talk a little bit about that and how the CBI is supporting its business members to show this leadership and purpose? Absolutely. It was a Prime Minister when I had the privilege of chairing the B7 before the G7. This was in May. And when he addressed us, he said that. He said the road to net zero is not a zero-sum game. Mm. And of course, in, in true Boris style, he said green is good. <laughs> so, um, but the reality is it is good. Mm -hmm. I was speaking at an event with Indonesia yesterday here, and a, 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 a figure just really stood out to me. Every megawatt of solar generates 7.4 jobs. Mm. Every megawatt of coal generates one job. Yeah. So solar power, since the 1990s, the cost has gone down by 15% per year. So these new technologies, and we haven't even started with hydrogen. If you look at the potential of something like hydrogen, if you look at heat, 
I chaired the Heat Commission. One third of greenhouse gas co emissions comes from heat. Half of that comes from buildings. And of the 29 million houses in this country, only, 20, only 1 million are up to the standard if we're going to reach net zero by 2050. So 28 million houses have to be retrofitted, insulated, heat pumps, community heating, hydrogen, and the jobs. It's jobs, jobs, jobs. It's going to create hundreds of thousands of jobs and the investment and the delivery of it. Then we've, there's a national center for the decarbonization of heat in the Midlands to actually deliver that. So there's huge potential, and I think the cost benefits of this is not only more environmental, but actually the economic costs are going to be off the charts. And then we should talk about biodiversity later as well, because Parth Das Gupta of Cambridge, the fantastic yeah. report he's written on the economics of biodiversity. Yeah. Well, but I want to come back on the question of leadership, because, you know, Rightly or wrongly, we've, we know many cases when there's brilliant evidence, the case for action is incontrovertible, and we still don't get the action quickly enough or at scale. So can you go into how the CEBI is galvanizing yeah. that leadership? And so what we're doing is, and again, the Duke of Wellington, his motto is, fortune favors the bold, fortune favors the brave. And how much braver can you get? At the beginning of this year, one of our members, EY, Ernst & Young, in the middle of a pandemic, said, we're going to go carbon negative in 2021. We thought, come on. I mean, that's a great statement. They've done it. They've already done it now in October. So that's walking the talk. And that's what we're encouraging our businesses. Yes, set the targets, but actually lead from the front. And that's why this is a great opportunity to showcase business leadership globally that we can all learn from. Great. Thank you. So, Siobhan, when I was listening to you on the radio early this morning, you picked up on a really important disconnect, which was the numbers of your members that had their net zero plans and the percentage of the public and consumers demanding more. Can you just talk a bit about that and how concretely you can help narrow that gap and indeed reverse it so that business is ahead of the consumers? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> our research earlier this year showed that about 11% of our members uh, had a net zero plan or had measured their carbon footprint. But at the same time, they also said, 50% of them said it was the most important thing for their consumers or their customers. So that is the disconnect that, that Claire is talking about. Um, <clears throat> the reason for that uh, is, is mainly concern over cost. So over 30% said it was um, upfront costs, and another 30% said it was access to finance. I'll give you a quick example. One of our members is an AI business, and they really want to move to energy efficient servers to become carbon neutral. He said to me, it's going to cost me 170,000 pounds to change my servers. I mean, how am I going to, how am I going to do that? So, we are concretely helping them do a number of things. On the net zero side, we're helping them measure their, their net zero uh, footprint through our net zero hub, for example, um, and also signposting them to sort of financial options, as well as you know, the thing we normally do around networking and, and policy development. Um, but actually, you know, what we also like to say is net zero is important, but actually, the other side of the coin, the more exciting side, is green innovation. Yeah. And that's where I think we can really make a difference. So if I give you an example of our East Lancashire Chamber, for example, um, they have low carbon chamber, they call it. And they have not just people helping you measure your, your carbon footprint, but actually, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? Here's the plan for you, because SMEs just don't have the people to do it. Here's the plan. Here's what it's going to cost, and here we will find that financing with you and for you. So already in the last year, they have bought new lab jobs through a, a company that uses bacteria to tackle pollution. Don't ask me any more details. Um, <laughs> they have 10 times the production of heat pumps in their county. And by the way, the, the company using bacteria to, to um, uh, combat pollution had been offered space and uh, acceleration, acceleration space in both Oxford and Cambridge, but has chosen Lancaster. Um, we need to spread the wealth across the country. Absolutely, levelling up. Yep, and, and our Lanc a Lancashire business has also now just won a multi-million pound contract for EV battery technology. So we really see those sort of 
hubs of exciting green innovation. And of course, it comes back to Stephen's point about jobs, because we need to move you know, clearly away from one to the other. So three things really, asking uh, government to put the right policy framework in place so that businesses have that confidence and certainty, helping communicate to them what to do, and then access to the finance they need to do it. Brilliant. Well, that segues me beautifully to Stephen. Um, so at this conference, we're hearing finally far more about scope three emissions. And I want you to talk a bit about how businesses and manufacturing are engaging with the supply chain, with that focus on SMEs and entrepreneurs in particular. And then if you can take us a bit further into your own thinking on the jobs of tomorrow too. Sure. Okay. Let's do that. Um, let's start thinking about SMEs and start looking at it through the SME lens. I think for many of the companies, and actually in manufacturing in this country, there's about 220,000 manufacturers, and, and most of those are SMEs, around 95%. To many of them, this looks like a cost issue. This looks like something that's going to cost a lot of money. It looks like something we have to have a plan for, an investment plan for, the financing for. And, and there again, you end up with a traditional reluctance then to actually commit to it. And that's always been one of the, one of the issues. What we've been finding in our regions and actually working closely in clusters and place is important, I'll come back to that, is that you end up with actually showing them by peer review, really, what other companies have done in a cost-effective way to implement net zero process improvements in their plants, which is important. But the other side of the equation is equally important, the one that uh, Siobhan just touched on, and that is the opportunity for new product development with these companies. Absolutely fantastic opportunity. Has been touched on, but I see, I'm very fortunate in this job, I see hundreds of companies involved in hydrogen um, fuel cell technology development, ammonia cracking, new methods of doing that, what we're doing in the carbon capture usage and storage supply chain. Lots of innovation going on there. That's where the government has rightly put some focus onto that. But in terms of, you know, if you look at the level three emissions and where we are going with that, there's also another opportunity around onshoring. And this is a really significant opportunity for the UK in a post-EU uh, world, one of the uh, and supply chain issues that we're seeing at the moment, on the, on the top of many board agendas is how do we build supply chain resilience in alongside the net zero agenda. And that leads many companies to think about onshoring some of those processes that were happening on the other side of the planet that were cause with uncontrolled carbon emissions because we're not quite sure what those suppliers are doing and can we bring that much further with investment into the UK. And that represents a fantastic opportunity for growth for our sector. So actually, once we start in these uh, areas, and we work in 11 regions around the UK, and we actually have many, many hundreds of companies now engaged in this, in looking at what local companies have done, being able to, if you like, learn from each other's experience and get them on the road. That way you can encourage them to do it. Otherwise, just sitting there reading the papers, a lot of these small companies owners will say, well, it looks like a lot of cost, I'm not sure how I'm going to afford it, and I'm not sure I've got all the skills to do it anyway. And just a point on the skills agenda for manufacturing yeah. that's quite specific in terms of green skills, one of the things that we have to get a lot better at is designing for net zero. This is designing products and supply chains and processes that work in the net zero context. Now that sounds pretty obvious sitting here in a conference in Glasgow, but if you've been making parts for trucks for the last 30 years, it's not very obvious to those, those uh, SMEs how they go about doing that. And in many cases, this is a really big upskilling opportunity for the manufacturing sector in the UK, and something we do need government, government support on in terms of green skills. But designing the right products of the future that have net zero at the forefront of their design criteria and their supply chains and processes is absolutely vital. The last thing that's really a manufacturing point is our digitization yeah. journey. A lot of you may know we're in the middle of the, what's called the fourth industrial revolution at the moment, which is down around digitization. One thing the pandemic taught the sector in the UK was how to collaborate digitally. And what we found was the effect on carbon neutrality was quite significant in people being able to do design collaboration and not travel and actually start to think about things in a different way. And this is absolutely vital for us the acceleration of digital adoption into the sector, where we've got fairly low penetration at the moment. It's great with the big manufacturers. Again, not so prevalent further down the supply chain. Focusing on that will give us enormous benefits and really being able to achieve what we want in terms of net zero for manufacturing in this country. So there's a few ideas in there, I would say, Claire. 
That's quite a lot, and it was very rich. There's a question there at the back. Can you, if you stand up and shout, is there a roving mic? Otherwise, just shout out or come and join me here. No? Please, come up, come up and just... Uh... Just say your name. And... Thank, you. Thank, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm Marcus Gover from RAP in the UK, and I wanted to ask about business leadership versus government leadership, because all the governments here are talking about territorial emissions, you know, their own countries, whereas businesses are talking about products, and they're talking about consumption emissions in your supply chains. And the differences are huge. I mean, we've done some modelling looking at the materials that go into products that we use. That says that in 2050, we'll probably be using 200 million tonnes of coal for the UK still. How do we get the people here to focus more about consumption emissions and products and cross boundaries rather than just their own countries and as business leaders, perhaps? Great. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah. I'm going to bring Karan in on that point because you were talking to me about cross-border just before we went on the platform. Yes. Um, I think that the point you're making is, is one of the crucial points here is about business and governments collaborating together. So government setting the targets is really important. It's really important to set that direction. It's great to have a country like India saying, we're going to commit to net zero. Okay, it's 2070. We led the way with 2050 in law. Um, and, and now many, many countries around the world are following and making that commitment. I think that's very important. The commitment to deforestation, that's fantastic news. So these are great, uh, I think, necessities. But business then has to lead the way. And, I, and the way I look at it is this. As, as somebody, I created Cobra Bear, a household name which I'm proud of. When, you, when you're an entrepreneur, you see problems, but you see solutions as well. And then you see a way of making it happen and making it happen quickly. And that's what business can do that government cannot necessarily do as well, is seeing the problem, seeing the solution, making it happen and acting on it. And that's where business has got to lead the way. And I think the commitments being made by businesses now are just fantastic and we're seeing it right here at COP. And I've spoken about some of them specifically as well earlier on my opening remarks. One point I do want to make is, we've got to look at this in the whole. This is not just about net zero. It is about biodiversity as well, but it's also about the circular economy. Yeah. I mean, I was in, in and we, I want to talk maybe later about clusters and regions that yeah. maybe- say a, few words, say a few words now and then I'll bring John in. Yeah, you about, talk about, about clusters, clusters and regions, yeah. Because it's so important also with your own individual business. I went up to a, a region, Teesside, uh, the other day with Ben Houchen, the mayor there, doing the work that he's uh, doing. And I went and visited the brewery there, Cameron's, that makes the Cobra Malabar Blonde IPA. You, I walked through the whole process. When you walk through a process in a brewery, you see how much is recycled. Uh, nothing is wasted. The yeast goes to make Marmite. The waste from when the brewing process goes as cattle feed. We try and breweries, many breweries, capture the carbon and reuse the carbon. You know, you, the, the, some breweries recycle the, the bottles and the, everything you're looking at, how can I recycle, how can I reuse it, how can I stop waste, how can I be environmentally friendly, as well as the net zero. And I think that is really important. And when it comes to place, I've seen the power of clusters. I mean, the best example of clusters we've got in this country is Cambridge. I mean, the Cambridge cluster that, that from that spun out ARM computers, Acorn, um, and now is a life sciences cluster. I mean, we talk, talk about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Well, where is AstraZeneca headquartered? In Cambridge. It's part of the life sciences cluster. And I think the power of clusters, I've just spoken at an event to do with Humberside and Hull. And there you've got the leader of the council, you've got the chancellor of the university, you've got a company like Reckitt, one of the biggest companies that invested 100 million pounds into that area. You've got EY, a partner of EY, the only big four firm over there. And you've got the president of CBI, one of the biggest business organizations, all of us promoting and working on a cluster. And then I'll go one step further. You have universities and business and government working together and you do it cross-border. When you have cross-border research between two universities, the field-weighted impact is usually three times higher than the university doing it on its own. And you bring in a business as well, it makes it even more powerful. Great. And what we're hearing already, of course, is that the whole economy of our title is going way beyond the borders of the UK. John, I want to bring you in because you have such extensive experience in China and you also spoke about the Institute of Directors itself having these international uh, branches and a cross-border um, impact uh, strategy. Yeah, I think there are, you know, clearly the, the Chinese government need to speak for China um, and that's a matter for them. Uh, my sense of it is that um, there's an opportunity 
for the UK in its presidency to be able to set some frameworks which are going to be, I believe, admired and followed by others. And I think that COP uh, in Glasgow, which has been a city of regeneration for a number of years, uh, is, is one opportunity for us to do that. The Institute, um, we have either sister organizations in India, in Canada, in New Zealand, in Australia, uh, and also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, starting to work in China uh, and in Africa. Uh, so what? The so what is that it's a common framework. And as uh, others have said, the opportunity for countries is to set a framework. And that's why it's so important they agree that framework because a common framework makes business easier to do. It's so much more difficult, and I've worked in 60 countries around the world, it is so much more difficult um, when you can't measure things to a common standard. So one example of a measurement to common standards, I used to work in the accounting profession for the first PwC and then Grant Thornton globally, and essentially IFRS is a common standard for the way you measure the accounting regulations worldwide. There is a need to have a common standard for the way we measure ESG. And this is something I feel, as you can tell by my tone of voice, very passionate about. I think it is incumbent on business to lead the way and for government to set the framework in which business can operate. And across that framework, that means it's a lot easier, and I'm sure colleagues would agree, for business to do the business we're good at, which is making money, creating jobs, and creating a thriving economies uh, for the future with a net zero focus. But you touch on something very important here, which um, underpins so much of the debate, which is the question of trust and credibility. You know, ESG, like net zero, is, a, is a, an acronym that we're hearing more and more and more. But for some people, it means different things to different people, and there isn't that sense of a commonly recognized standard. And so I think that is a, that's certainly a test that we at CISL are really focusing on about what will it look like to have that kind of common standard that can then have that public trust. I want to now do a pivot to what Karan and others have sort of already touched on, which is this question of not just nature and biodiversity, but also the society, inclusion and equality, and bring Siobhan and uh, Stephen back in. This COP has got more emphasis on people and nature, on the just transition and on biodiversity than any other COP as far as I'm aware. Um, but I want to understand, we know that round board tables in business, the nature piece has hardly begun. So I'd really like to get a, a, a deep understanding, starting with Siobhan, on how we know how long it took us to go from Nick Stern's report to where we're at now. You mentioned the Das Gupta review, which is you know, relatively hot off the presses. I don't want it to take that long before it becomes the new normal. What do business leaders do to push the nature agenda and the inclusive society agenda so it makes sense for business decision making and investment. Siobhan. Thank you. Um, we are hosting a business lounge in the city of Glasgow College uh, for these four first days of COP and yesterday morning we started um, our events with a, ta with a, with a panel on, on women in green trade. So a couple of points to that. <clears throat> About 10% of UK businesses export, about 60% of chamber members export. Trade is very much at the heart of our global network. And trade is really something that can be used to drive many of those agendas you talked about. So not just gender equality, but biodiversity, um, and of course the wider green agenda. Um, and we had Emily Thornbury yesterday talking about um, not trade plus X, but actually starting with the SDGs, yep. starting from the 17 goals and working from there. And by working from that common framework, we can have, a, we can have one conversation. Now, the issue is um, bringing the SDGs into your everyday business life is, is a challenge. So actually, how do we as organizations help our members use that framework to tell their story you know we know that our members are incredibly you know they are they are a force for good in their communities they're members of their local chambers they employ their local young people they support local charities they improve their built environment and we need to help them tell that story because they're not yeah. doing it themselves and actually we know that their consumers want to hear about that and people want to work for businesses like that so it's a really important question about 
how we help them tell that story. But you have a background, I think, in advertising at some point in your distinguished career. So that art of mes message making, I don't mean greenwashing, I don't mean superficial, I mean what I would call sense making or cutting through the noise, cutting through the complexity. Are there things you've learned from that part of your background that can help us in the worlds of business and government to cut through the noise now? There is a lot of noise. I mean, really there's a is. lot of. As Literally. A bit, <laughs> As a business, it's like, well, I don't know, what should, what should I do? Should I become a B yeah. Corps? Should I use the SDGs? Yeah, exactly. uh, should I talk about ESG? Does anyone know what that means? I mean, how, how, I don't know. So actually, we as the chambers are looking at how we can help our businesses tell that story because, of course, they cover all sectors and all regions, and it has to be a simple, clear story with a simple message, and that's what we're trying to help. We're thinking about how, how we can help them do that. Just quickly, very quickly, I, I really want to build on what you've said. Um, I, I've, I've had this mantra at, at Cobra from the time I started Cobra Beer that it's not just good enough to be the best in the world, you've got to be the best for the world. <laughs> and it's not just what you do, but how you do it. And, and I think it's got to be this whole business with a purpose is now being spoken about more and more. And if you think about where it's come, we had PPP, People, Planet, Prosperity. Then you had CSR. Corporate social responsibility. Now you've got ESG, but it's all down to having business with a purpose. Yes, but we heard one of you, and I'm sorry I forget which one. Somebody talked about the subset, the subset of business that may be focusing, or, or a bank or whatever, on ESG and so on. And I think that question of how do we go from brilliance as a subset to the new normal? The mantra on our new building in Cambridge will be, which is a, a sustainable retrofit, is this is not an ordinary building, but it should be. And I want to know what is, how do we make ESG, SDGs, whatever thing you want to do, absolutely a no-brainer. Stephen, you're nodding and I want to no, get you, bring absolutely, you in. Absolutely, because um, we, we, okay, so we do see some examples, but it's limited. Okay, yeah. that's, the, that's the honest answer. I've seen some incredible examples where large manufacturers are thinking about you know exactly the effect of their supply chain on these issues in those countries where deforestation is happening or whatever and actually going away from it and making conscious decisions about changing that supply chain as a result of that or i've seen people actually running gold mines in south america and actually investing back in the local villages and actually not using you know noxious chemicals in the process and finding innovative ways of doing it very interesting sort of approaches I think the most important thing, and you've heard it, I think, as a common theme, is about communicating this. We have the best effect as business organizations when we have best practice and we can showcase it and we can bring people on the journey with us. And our role, part of our role, is definitely around communicating those best practice ideas. So not only on net zero, but on the wider issue, particularly around all these other issues around ESG, it's around translating that into something that's real for those businesses and particularly for the smaller businesses a lot of them think this doesn't affect them but it does affect them and they can have a contribution to it so it's really up to us to help communicate that message more and move this forward I mean there's a I would say the take up on the net zero agenda is very rapid now it's like an exponential curve what we need to achieve is a similar exponential curve on these other items it's very important and we can do that by example I think by showing really good live case studies about how companies are doing it now. Yeah, John. Just, just to add to that, I think, um, I'll add another kind of passion uh, from the IOD. Can you speak IOD. a fraction I, I, add another passion from the IOD, which is about the directors of tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is about the new generation, the next generation, the people, as Karen has said, are coming through our universities. Fantastic university here in Glasgow and Strathclyde. We've got Napier in Scotland, St Andrews, my alma mater, and others. And it's so important that we see the opportunity that comes from the next generation. And that is another area where certainly the business organizations can do a lot, and we do a lot in that space, in order to encourage that next generation with all the innovation and the hope that they have, the hope that is created through places like this, the hope that is created by leaders having a common framework because it's that next generation you know I'm, I'm a male pale stale you know uh, individual unfortunately but I have great hope for my children I've got great hope for my grandchildren and I think that is going to come through the leverage that we get through 
the amazing work that's done in universities, not just in the UK, but also around the world. And that comment about collaboration, it's collaboration in new manufacturing styles, it's collaboration in the way that we, we use digital, it's collaboration, 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 and putting that at the heart of ESG and putting that in the boardroom is true great governance. So, I mean, yes, 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 and yes. But when we think about that, that hope and that next generation, it brings us back to that question of social inclusion. Now, depending where you're sitting right now, depending how COVID hit you or your business, you can feel this is about the least inclusive time you've ever lived through. If you're in certain countries, as we know only too well, there is huge divide or mistrust or wariness and so on, even around the debates happening now. So I'm really interested in... I will call it as it is, the moral compass, the moral responsibility, and the public voice that businesses, both through their leaders and through their rising employees, can show collectively in this space. Who wants to pick that up? I saw your microphone waggle, so you get the first word. <laughs> well, I think you talk to, just building on what John said, you, you talk to young people today, and survey after survey shows that the two things are more important to them than others. One, they passionately care about climate change, sustainability, environment, biodiversity, they care about it. The second thing is diversity and inclusion. Yeah. And when they're applying to a company or looking, they will see, does this company live those two things? And, and they're looking out for it. So, and, and diversity, by the way, now, we're getting far more diverse in this country, yeah. in the UK. But diversity, there was a title in a Harvard Business Review article, I remember, recently, diversity without inclusion is useless. Yeah. So you've also got to have that atmosphere, the mentoring, the culture to create that inclusion that allows the diversity to flourish. Excellent. So, oh, sorry, and no. I launched a CBI, Change the Race Ratio. It's an initiative to champion ethnic minority diversity across all business and institutions. And we've got 100 of the leading institutions, including universities, have signed up to it. Fantastic. So I'll pass to Stephen and then beyond, and I'll, I'll invite you to also say a particular sort of priority as your sort of closing words oh, to the right. panel or a call to action. Don't worry, I'll give you a last chance. Uh, Stephen. I was just going to underline, Claire, the point about, about uh, the youngsters coming into industry, particularly in manufacturing. We run the largest apprentice training centre yeah. in the country at Birmingham. It's got 1,600 young apprentices doing robotics and mechatronics. It's a very diverse group. They're very enthusiastic about net zero. They're constantly challenging the tutors about is this really the way that the manufacturing process should, should, should actually occur, should it be actually configured differently and the passion and enthusiasm there is, is great. So if ever I'm feeling a little bit under pressure I go to Aston and I sit there for a day with a focus group with the apprentices and you get totally enthused by really what we can see as the next generation coming through here. So that's important but it does bring me on to the big thing yeah. for me which is green skills. Yeah. Because what I see across the country is a real lack of understanding. Yeah. I see some fear about this is going to cost me a lot of money, this is going to be difficult to do. What I don't see a lot of, apart from in pockets, where I see great innovation, what we do need to have is a big push, and this is where government needs to help us, on green skills, around designing for green, process re-engineering, upskilling our workforces to think in this different way, and that's something we could do now. We could start on that yeah. process now, vitally important, and by the way, helps us a lot with things like levelling up. Manufacturing companies are not in city centres. They tend to be very well dispersed around the country. This creates new jobs and it creates better jobs for the future. So I think, you know, one thing we are trying to push very hard on is the green skills agenda, and that would be my one big ask here. And coupling the green skills agenda with the power of place, that place-based resilience that you spoke about, sounds like a really winning combination. Siobhan, you've... I've kept you silent for a little bit, so feel free also to pick up on other things you've heard as you also give your closing call to action. Thank you, thank you. So Glasgow City College, as we heard yesterday, teaches 2,000 courses, and every single one has climate in their curriculum. Bloody that hell. is how we need to teach our young people. And, and they, of course, are teaching us. So when we bring young people into our organizations, they are teaching us how to do it. And a bit like your building, having spent many years um, as an angel investor in social enterprises, we talk a lot about how we no longer want them to be social enterprises, we just want them to be enterprises. Yes. And actually, <clears throat> when you or me or any of our young people go and register their first company at Companies House, why doesn't it say to you, 
How are you thinking about your social impact? How are you thinking about your environmental impact? What are you putting into your articles of association when you're thinking about those things? It's such a simple thing to do. So I guess my sort of final point would be, you know, let's do that. Let's do that together. Maybe we should, let's do that together. Yeah. Maybe this is what we should take away with us. Yeah. Together, let's work out how we can help our members tell their story, tell their story of business as a force for good. You heard it here, but please hold on to this because I'm really interested in new initiatives and new collaborations, and this is just the sort of forum to do it. John, I raise you Siobhan's, <laughs> Siobhan's well, suggestion. That's quite, quite, quite difficult to top, but I think the, um, every time somebody goes and registers at a company's house, they do it as a director. Yeah. So you know, we have incumbent on us the responsibility to step up and demonstrate what a director should be doing. And I've mentioned earlier on a call that we have, and we've put it out today, uh, around the Corporate Governance Code, the Section 172 of the Companies Act. There are some specific things that can be done to improve the environment in which business can make decisions that are going to be positive for our planet in every possible dimension. So I would say the IOD is here for all directors, no matter where they are, key, creed, colour, kith, kin, wherever, and around the world. I would say we have three things we focus on. Connecting directors one to another so they can learn without fear or favour, not trying to sell to each other, but trying to connect positively. Second thing we do is develop. So we spend a lot of time and energy developing the skills of directors through our training courses and the work we do. That is in collaboration again with other business organisations, but specifically we connect, we develop. And finally we influence. And that really is what the business organisations are, are there to do. To, if you like, hold up a mirror to government of what is really important to our members. And of course, the one thing that is super important to our members and has been crystallising over the past few years is around climate change, sustainability, and as Lord Benamori has already said, around uh, inclusion and diversity. Not DNI, but inclusion and diversity. And those are very powerful things that we can help support business to be a force for good around. Fantastic. Thank you. Karen. Thank you very much. Just two points to make as we conclude. Uh, one is that innovation. I really think that we need to power ahead with innovation. We underinvest as a country. Yeah. We spend 1.7% of GDP on R&D and innovation versus Germany, America 2.8, Israel 4%. If we spent that 1% more, that's 20 billion pounds a year more. Just imagine what we could do with innovation, particularly when it comes to the area we're talking about in terms of net zero and climate change. And finally, the dusk of the review. He describes um, nature as our most precious asset. And Sir David Attenborough, when he commented on this review, he said, by bringing economics and ecology face to face, we can help to save the natural world, and in doing so, save ourselves. And finally, one of my great friends and um, most respected members of the House of Lords who sits on the cross benches with me, Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, who was former Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, former President of the Royal Society, I finished with this quote from him. He said just now, our earth is 45 million centuries old, but this century is the first one when species, ours, can determine the biosphere's fate. Thank you. Thank you. So, quite impossible to sum up with all the strands we've had here, but just to call out a couple of things. Uh, in the title, you see it, the BGA is a business group alliance. And it was John who talked about without fear or favor, I think was your phrase. <clears throat> My equivalent phrase is non-transactional. <clears throat> How do we think about a collaborative paradigm that goes beyond the conventional limits of what we might have been brought up to think of as competition? We still go for profits, for success, for innovation, but we look beyond it to think about those root changes, that systemic change that will enable successful companies to flourish ever more, to give much better conditions to their workers where, in whatever part of the world. And I think to think about life and life chances, whether you're in a poor part of the UK or a poor part elsewhere in the world. And that radical connectivity of people, nature and climate seems to me a conversation that is ripe to hit the boardrooms, hit the training programs, hit the business schools and so on. And so the whole economy lens, as you've heard, is actually deeply human. 
in the way that we actually think how it will be achieved. There is an incredible opportunity now. I don't want to instrumentalize COVID or say any more cliches, but it has reminded us both of the new localism which you talked about the power of place. You talked about the need for people to reconfigure the way they work, the way they balance their lives. But it also made us think much more fundamentally about both mental and physical health. And so I think it, I, I, I leave you with my own favorite current phrase, which is about health generating. What is a health generating company, a health generating supply chain, a health generating city, a health generating business network. And when we think about that, you cannot dissociate human and planetary health. And so that connected thinking um, is something that I would expect confidently to be seeing in some of the new narratives. And I would like to finish by both thanking our great panelists, but also by uh, putting Siobhan in the spotlight to say, I think it would be wonderful if out of these two weeks, this idea of interconnecting net networks with a really creative forward vision could actually be something that could capture popular imagination, including from those who currently see themselves as outside opportunity because they're not in on a university track, they're not in it, they don't know how to access the skills that we talked about, and those are the people who are absolutely fundamental if a whole economy is also to mean a sustainable society and community. So with that, you've been a brilliant audience. I'm sorry if some of you put your hands up and I didn't see them, um, but thank you so much for um, sparing time in this insane schedule to be with us, and we really appreciated this. It's been live streamed, and let's keep the debate going by t on Twitter or whatever platform you prefer. But with that, will you please join me in thanking our great panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.